The next item we're going to talk about is our city manager's presentation of the long awaited preliminary plan to restructure the Iowa City Police Department toward community policing. So I'm gonna hand it over to our city manager, Jeff Froin. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm going to um, do my best to move through this uh, quickly. Um, uh, hopefully we can at least wrap it up before the start of your formal meeting um, and we can revisit it as, as needed uh, uh, going forward. So um, I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's my pleasure to present to you an overview of the preliminary plan that you requested as part of your June 2020 resolution addressing Black Lives Matter and systemic racism. Now, the past seven months, I've spent a significant portion of my time gaining a deeper understanding of our police operations, policies, and practices. I've looked at where we've been and where we stand today. And one thing I'm very certain of is that we have a very good police department. They are leaders in many areas and have set high expectations for themselves when it comes to excellence in public service. And when I say we have a good department, I'm not so much focused on our policing skills, although we have extremely talented staff. I'm more talking about the people behind the uniforms and the civilians that serve us too. They are good, caring people and want nothing more than to serve this community to the best of their abilities. And this is what our foundation is. It's strong and it's ready to pursue whatever future lies ahead. And if any group of employees can rise to the challenges of new expectations that this final plan will eventually contain, it's our police staff. Listen, we know we're not perfect. No city department is perfect. Um, we know that we make mistakes and, and, and this year has certainly given us a deeper appreciation for the consequences of those mistakes. I think what we need now is a renewed opportunity to lead. Uh, we need city council support. We need community support. We need your trust that we can execute on wherever the, this plan ultimately lands. I'm not presenting this preliminary plan as a blueprint. It's, it's rather it's presented as a, as a start. It has 36 recommendations that change the way we operate, the way we communicate, and that reinforce the community and community policing. It's designed to be scalable in many ways. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, it's de designed to keep the conversation going and, and not uh, just be a simple uh, check the box type of plan. So I strongly encourage anybody who's interested in this topic uh, not to solely rely on my overview tonight. The written plan contains much more detail than I can cover in our limited time tonight. So please take, uh, take some time to read, read it and uh, provide some feedback. And we'll talk about those opportunities at the end. The document itself is available online at icgov.org slash preliminary plan. Um, you can also access uh, public feedback opportunities there including a survey where you can uh, voice support uh, or uh, uh, provide comments on, on uh, any or all of the 36 recommendations contained in the plan. The structure of the plan or the organization is listed on the screen. Um, it reviews some recent history of the department before jumping into those 36 recommendations. And I'll cover each of these uh, sections tonight in varying levels of detail. So here's our mission statement. Uh, it was revised in March of 2019, so it's very new. Uh, it is to work in partnership with the community, enhance trust, protect with courage and compassion, and empower victims of crime through excellence and service. And this is what we work towards every day. Uh, we have just under 110 permanent positions in the department, almost 25% of which are civilian staff. And in the interest of time tonight, I'm not going to go through our org chart in detail, but it is available in the plan, along with brief descriptions of each of our uh, positions. So the chart that you're seeing on the screen now uh, denotes the change in PD staff uh, and budget since 2010. And I'll walk you through some of the highlights here. So from 2010 to 2020, the department added just 5.26 positions. 2.26 uh, of those positions were civilian positions and three were sw sworn police officer positions. The table uh, at the bottom gives you details on those staffing changes. The three new sworn positions actually resulted in one less traditional patrol position uh, as one patrol position was eliminated and the uh, new sworn positions were three community policing positions and one supervisory position. Uh, those new positions included the uh, community policing positions of downtown liaison officer and neighborhood response officer, 
There was also another supervisor in the investigations area added. And those downtown officer and neighborhood response uh, positions, again, are not your typical patrol positions as their day-to-day -day duties aren't uh, completely driven by dispatched calls for service. They're intended to be proactive problem-solving positions that utilize community relationships to help prevent crime, to help those in need and improve outcomes for residents and, and neighborhoods. The civilian positions that were added over this uh, period of time included our community outreach assistant, our victim ser services coordinator, and 1.26 uh, positions in our animal services division. Our sworn staffing per 1,000 population has decreased over this time from 1.19 to 1.12. And I'm gonna talk through those numbers now and then I'll circle back to the budget. Uh, so this is the most common measuring stick for department staffing um, and uh, the U.S. Department of Justice reports on these figures annually. It's again, it's number of sworn positions, those are your officer positions, uh, by 1,000 residents. Uh, the uh, Iowa City has a number of 1.12 per 1,000 residents. The United States average is 2.3 positions per 1,000. Now that number is a bit inflated by the very large cities uh, typically. So you can break it down by Midwestern cities with a population that's similar to ours. And their average would be 1.5. The difference between 1.12 and 1.5 may not seem like a lot, but it actually would translate to 29 positions. That's to say, if we wanted to be at that average number, uh, we would have to add 29 sworn positions. So you can look at the other larger cities in Iowa. There's four larger cities in Iowa City, and they range from 1.52 to 1.66. And if you want to focus on college towns, uh, if you look at the, across the Big Ten college towns, their average would be 1.48. Um, and there's only three of those uh, communities that have a lower number than Iowa City. So there's no right or wrong number here, and you're never going to hear me advocate for staffing based on a metric like this. Your staffing needs would be determined by your operational demands and, and your community expectations. But what this does say is that we're not a staff heavy to police department. We're comparatively lean and efficient. From a budget standpoint, uh, over that 10 year period, uh, the average annual growth of the police department budget is 3.6%. We've consistently been between 23.88 and 25.65% of the general fund budget since 2012. And that level of increase is very consistent with what we see in other departments. And it's largely attributable to wages, health insurance, state pension payments, and inflationary growth in supplies. From year to year, budgets will fluctuate based on one-time items such as in the police budget, deer sharpshooting like we did last year, vehicle purchases, and consulting studies. Now in the police department, 86% of the budget is related to personnel. It's very labor intensive. About 15% is going to non-personnel ex expenses like training, vehicle, uh, vehicles, fuel, IT services, pet supplies at the animal shelter, those types of things. When you're that heavy on personnel, you're going to probably in a typical year have three to 4% growth that's needed. You think about bargained wages with the unions, you think about health insurance premiums, and again, state pension payments that are mandated that, that we make, that's three to 4% is gonna be pretty typical. So when you see an average growth of 3.6% over a 10 year periods, that is very much a status quo budget. I'm gonna get into calls for service a little bit. Uh, in 2009, uh, 19, that breaks down to about 200 calls for service per day. Now, just over half of our calls are initiated by the public. That means they're based on 911 calls, uh, non-emergency calls, uh, or someone that might flag down an officer while they're on duty. The 46% that are officer initiated, uh, most of these would fall into the categories like traffic stops. If the officer observes you speeding or running a red light, um, we do a lot of bar checks at night. Those would all be calls for services when we're, when we're evaluating those establishments. Even attendance at community events would be uh, counted as a call for service that's initiated by an officer. Uh, nearly half of our responses as officers result in no action and only about 10% of our calls for service end in arrest or citation. So I want to uh, kind of pivot over to crime stats right now. Um, Iowa City is a very safe community, uh, but we, we can't be naive. We have serious crime that takes place nearly every day, and all these crimes have victims. 
We average multiple theft offenses per day, multiple assault offenses per day, and daily occurrences of fraud, drug violations, and vandalism. The most concerning is the rapid growth in weapon violations. 2019 was up 97% over the previous four year average. And I really wanna call your attention to the, the right side of the screen there and just looking at the shots fired incidents that we've had from 2019 to this year. In 2019, we had 15 shot fired incidents. This year, we're up to 56. In 2019, those incidents had about 56 rounds that were fired. We're over 300 in 2020. Five individuals were injured in those shot fired incidents last year. We have 16 individuals that were, have been injured this year uh, with several weeks left in the year. This should concern all of us greatly. Let's look at uh, violent crime rates. Uh, this takes you back all the way to 1995. Uh, what you'll see here is the blue line is the national average, the green line is the state of Iowa, and the bars are Iowa City. So again, we're a comparatively safe community that is consistently below those national and state averages. Going from violent crime to, to property crime rates, uh, you can see that we're again well below those state and national um, uh, uh, numbers there indicated in the, in the lines. So my takeaways from all this information so far, I think the crime statistics illustrate that we're a relatively safe community uh, and uh, we operate kind of below those state and national figures. And this is really despite some status quo staffing levels that we have um, that are well below our national and peer community staffing averages. But make no mistake, we have concerning cr criminal activity that occurs on a daily basis and there's great consequences to the victims of those crimes and the residents in the neighborhoods that experience trauma from nearby criminal activity. For good reason, we need to be hyper-focused on use of force. And first, it needs to be clear that in every incident, we should aim to use no force or the minimal amount necessary to protect everybody's safety. So here's some data on our use of force. Less than one half of 1% of calls for service result in use of force. Those numbers can overstate force a bit because we define use of force in a way that may include no physical altercation with an individual. So for example, these numbers include situations where an officer displays a taser but does not use that taser. It also involves use of force needed to euthanize an animal such as an injured deer uh, after a vehicle accident. So this fall, we, re we excuse me, revamped our public use of force reports that we submit to the Community Police Review Board. We now include much more information on the individual cases, as well as aggregated demographics such as race, mental impairment, drug or alcohol usage, and the number of officers involved. I'm certainly not aware of any other uh, agency here in Iowa that now provides more uh, public information on our use of force incidents. The preliminary plan also recaps the October report we issued on the 23 year history of Iowa City's CPRB, that's the Community Police Review Board. That report detailed 119 complaints we've received since 1997. And it's important to note that the CPRB has agreed with the police chief's findings in 93% of those complaints. That full report is a, a part of this plan. Um, and uh, you can look through that if you wanna see the details on those complaints. There's a chapter in the report that deals with recent community policing initiatives. I'm gonna breeze through this section of the plan, uh, but it includes um, some analysis of additional positions that are focused on community policing, our diversion efforts, our supportive services efforts, and our targeted outreach. I really encourage you to spend the time to read this information. I think you'll be very proud of the progress that we've made. One community police, uh, policing case study that I would like to highlight is our effectiveness in working with community partners to improve outcomes for our homeless population. And I wanna be careful here not to appear to take full credit for these results, but it's absolutely fair to say that Iowa City Police Department has played a big role in these efforts. Our data-driven justice program helped pave the way for the Cross Park Place project. This was Iowa's first Housing First program and you can see how effective it's been. The residents living in this facility previously spent an average of 170 days per year in jail. After just one year, that number averaged 28 and is, is expected to drop even more in the second year. Similarly, because in large part, due, to, due in large part to our downtown liaison uh, community policing position, 
we saw cause, calls for service pertaining to the homeless populations drop from 450 to 300 in three years. And the number of associated arrests or citation dropped to about 1% of those calls for service. This should make you proud and hopefully give you confidence that we can continue to be part of the solution for some of our community's most complex problems. So now we're gonna get into the recommendation section um, and really focus on how we become the leader. As cities across the country are looking at police reform, how does Iowa City lead the way? Each of the following recommendations are described in more detail in the report. And I again urge everybody to read uh, the written report so that you can understand the hope and intent behind each one. So here's the 36 ways to get us started down this path. I wanna start with analyzing how we respond to calls involving someone in crisis. And it's really important to recognize that no two calls are the same. As such, there's no res singular response structure that's going to be a match for all crisis calls. The easy thing to do here is to say that the CAHOOTS model will solve all our problems. And sure, that would help for some calls, but if that was our only focus, we'd be failing our community. We need to be prepared for crises of many different shapes. And frankly, individual calls regarding people in crisis can change dramatically during that call. A seemingly safe call can turn violent and a seemingly violent situation can be effectively de-escalated. The fluidity of the calls underscores the need for focus, preparation, and coordination at all points along this continuum. Now, I'm really stressing that we think of uh, crisis calls across this continuum and we take steps to improve our community's response at all points along it. And notice I said community's response. This shouldn't be all on the shoulders of our police department. So let's walk through each of these points from prevent to divert to co-respond and to stabilize and connect. So prevention, best, this is the best outcome possible. This is we prevent the need for any call for service to ever take place. And this emphasizes that the community should do all it can to create a safe, supportive and accessible network of resources to keep people from entering a stage of crisis. So the way you do it is you have to invest more in our social service network. And council, you've done that in recent years. You've increased our aid agencies program by well over 50% in the last two years. You provided $2.5 million for the new Guidelink Center. You invest in affordable housing and services like the winter shelter. But if we wanna get serious about being effective in preventing calls for service, you have to think on a different scale. Uh, I'm suggesting uh, that it's time to give your local option sales tax a serious conversation in 2021 with uh, at least 15 to 25% of those proceeds going to our nonprofit community. So that's recommendation number one. Um, and we just talked about um, our uh, interaction with the homeless population. I told you how proud I am of the work that we've done there. Uh, we should be proud, but we shouldn't be content. And we need to uh, think about civili civilianizing uh, this effort. And thus I'm uh, recommending that we partner with the shelter house to jointly fund a new street outreach and engagement specialist that would be employed by the shelter house and that would work in close cooperation with the police department to proactively connect individuals to services and prevent police calls for service from being generated by the public. Lastly, we need to do more to proactively support our immigrant and refugee population. We need to hire someone from within this community to help perform outreach and help those that are new to our country and our community. This person would work both ways, educating our residents and educating our officers. We need to build these bridges. And in my mind, we need to hire from within the community in order to do so effectively. So the third recommendation is to create a half-time permanent civilian community outreach assistant position that focuses solely on outreach and engagement with Iowa City's growing immigrant and refugee population. As we move along the spectrum now, I'm gonna talk about diversion. Recognizing that we can't prevent all calls for crisis, our next priority should be to safely divert as many, as possible, many calls as possible away from law enforcement. If an officer doesn't need to respond, then let's not respond. Now, we are blessed in Johnson County to already have a 24-7, 365 mobile crisis response team that operates as part of community crisis services. It's fully accredited operation, and in 2019, they responded to 551 calls in Iowa City alone. The mobile crisis is staffed by full-time employees in a central office, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 
Outside of these hours, the service is staffed by on-call counselors who are dispatched from a decentralized location and then mobilized with the teammate before responding. Thus, response times during on-call uh, hours lag behind those during staffed office, hour, uh, staffed office hours. The mobile crisis team averaged 38 minutes for a response time within Johnson County and 27 minutes inside of Iowa City. The program has a very impressive 85% diversion rate. Uh, that means those are the clients that are diverted um, if, if the counselors are able to stabilize them at home or connect them with resources without having to rely on an emergency room or jail. So while we're blessed with this service, I, I think it's safe to say that 90 plus percent of our population doesn't even know it exists. Thus, the recommendation for really gets at the city taking an active role in promoting the mobile crisis service. We have a platform as a city government and we need to use it to promote the service that exists to the community. So promoting it is important, but we have to plan for expanding it as well, especially if we want to see them take on a higher percentage of calls. This is a bit more complex as it's currently a countywide service. And thus, we're going to need some regional cooperation in order to do this right. The good news is there's a blueprint for that type of collaboration. It's the GuideLink Center. In that case, the county took the lead and made it happen with contributions from local governments. Uh, in this case, I think it's our turn to take the lead and see if we can work with community to get this expanded uh, throughout Johnson County. The sixth recommendation is to convene stakeholders from the mental health region, community, mobile crisis team, and the Joint Emergency Communication Center staff and board to discuss integration of mobile crisis services into the dispatch process. Uh, it's, mobile crisis is currently dispatched by, mental health, by the mental health region and it's not integrated into our 911 system. So why is this important? Nearly every single person at a very young age knows how to dial 911, but how many of us can recite the 1-800 crisis number? How many people are gonna take time to find that number in a crisis? Now, in July of 2022, we expect the recently approved National 988 crisis line will take effect, and that will help, but we should still pursue 911 integration and train our dispatchers to be able to determine if calls can be safely diverted uh, to mobile crisis. This is, again, is a regional question and not one that Iowa City can unilaterally answer. Thus, we need to be conveners and facilitate this action. Outside of mobile crisis, we have a few other options to consider under the divert category. Iowa City Police Department has three civilian community service officers. Most recognize them by the white pickup trucks that they drive. These individuals perform a variety of tasks, both internal to the PD and external to the community. Externally, they help with traffic control, removing road hazards, enforcing parking, and a whole lot more. In 2019, they responded to more than 4,400 calls for service. While their capacity is maxed out now, we should really look at uh, whether this model can be ex expanded. And that's the recommendation seven. Lastly, uh, counselors have suggested revisiting the topic of automated traffic enforcement de uh, devices. This was actually recommended by the police department back in 2011 and was approved by the council in 2012. However, before implementation, there was a citizen initiative opposing ATEs and in 2013, the council reversed course and explicitly banned such devices in our code. These traffic enforcement devices are a significant point of contention in the cities that use them and can be very polarizing. This is candidly not something I'm very excited about, but if the council wants to go down this path, you should have some in-depth conversations and make sure that there's a political will to do so. So number eight is that the city council should determine if you wish to revisit the concept of ATEs and if the technology is something that you want to explore, you need to provide staff direction so that we can gather the information that will be helpful to you as you make your uh, decisions. While prevention and diversion of calls should be a priority for the community, there will continue to be a large volume of calls for service for which a civilian response team is not comfortable or safe responding to. These instances could incur situations involving weapons, persons with a known history of violence, or other similar factors that become apparent through the dispatch process. For some of these calls, it will be possible to respond with a co-responding pair, which would include one law enforcement officer and one civilian mental health professional. 
The role of the officer, often in plain clothes, is to ensure safety while maximizing opportunities for the crisis prevent professional to interact with the individual. This fall, city staff joined Johnson County Jail Alternative staff and community crisis services and successfully applying for a grant from the East Central Mental Health Region. With this grant, the Mental Health Region will fund a civilian co-responder position to be employed by community um, their, within their mobile crisis unit. And this funding commitment includes 100% of the personnel cost in year one, and that steps down to 75% in year two, 50% in year three, and 25% in years four and beyond. And while the position will be employed outside of the department with community, the police department will pay a portion of the salary that is not covered under the grant. The city's in discussion with uh, the Mental Health Region, Community Crisis Services, and Foundation 2, which is a well-respected crisis response nonprofit in Lynn County, about how the program will be structured. Foundation 2 brings great expertise to the table as they have a similar successful program with the Cedar Rapids Police Department. Their guidance, training, and expertise will help ensure the co-responding partnership finds success here in Iowa City. So once we have some of the memorandums of understanding established, the city council will be presented with more information and asked to formally commit to this program. The benefits of a co-responding program go far beyond the outcomes of individual calls for service. Other law enforcement agencies who have adopted this model have found that the position's presence within the department increases overall awareness of mobile crisis uh, services and increases the number of referrals made by law enforcement. Uh, the presence of the program can also positively influence officer discretion over time. That civilian position can play a role in training officers, de-escalation techniques, and educating the community about prevention resources and diversion opportunities. Uh, lastly, this model is very easy to expand if it's desired in the future, and such expansion will be needed if we want to ensure that there's a co-responder team available at all times uh, around the clock. Despite all the efforts to prevent, divert, and even co-respond, there's going to be calls for service that require law enforcement to assume control of the scene. Uh, such calls include volatile situations when public safety is clearly a concern, or when a co-responder team or mobile crisis unit isn't available to handle a call in a timely manner. In these situations, the city needs to continue to ensure that officers have proper training and are focused on securing uh, a safe scene and de-escalating the immediate threat or crisis. After the scene is stabilized, the officers need to have resources available other than the jail and the emergency rooms to connect individuals to receive the proper follow-up care. Um, item 10, uh, then a recommendation 10 is that the, the PD should continue to ensure that all officers receive the uh, um, initial crisis intervention training and subsequent continuing education uh, in de-escalation techniques and the department shall continue to encourage personnel to obtain CIT instructor certification. And this is an important commitment. The investment in CIT has absolutely elevated the service that we provide to the community. Our investments in CIT have brought uh, great state and national recognition and our CIT certified trainers have been asked to present at statewide and national conferences about the positive experiences that we've seen here in Iowa City. Recommendation number 11 is that the uh, police department should partner with the Iowa Department of Public Health to begin carrying Narcan to better assist those experiencing an op op opioid, opioid overdose when no medical professionals on scene to assume such care. We're oftentimes the first on scene uh, for a call for services and officers do everything they can to stabilize situations and provide care for those victims that may be in crisis. Um, Narcan is an opioid antagonist that can quickly counter the effects of, of an overdose. It was designed for use by first responders and caregivers and requires no formal medical training to dispense. Timely use of Narcan can save lives and allow medical professionals who may arrive to the scene later than the police more time to properly care for a person in crisis. Recommendation 12 uh, involves a new online reporting tool called CARE. Uh, the Iowa City Police Department, through uh, the work of the Data-Driven data -driven Justice Initiative, has helped provide feedback uh, informing the development of this tool, and it will allow the department to better understand the number and types of calls for service, uh, crisis calls for service, the disposition of those calls, 
effective techniques to resolve those calls and determine if the training uh, that we receive is consistent with the types of calls that we're actually receiving. In addition, the system can automate the referral process so local service providers can quickly and easily make connections with individuals who may benefit from their services. We've talked a lot about the GuideLink Center in recent months, uh, but for the public's sake, this is a huge benefit that it's gonna be opening its doors in February of 2021. It will provide law enforcement a much needed third option beyond the jail and emergency room for people who may need some type of professional assistance with a crisis or substance abuse issue. Uh, the facility will enhance services to those uh, in need in a non-punitive manner and provide the best opportunity for someone in crisis um, to access those services, uh, both in the short and long term. Uh, we have to maximize the use of this facility and we have to make sure that we're actively engaged in sharing feedback and helping shape future planning. So 13 is that the police chief should designate a command staff team to analyze the department's usage of GuideLink Center and actively participate in ongoing intergovernmental evaluation and planning efforts to explore how the facility can best meet the changing needs of our community over time. Council was gracious enough to approve our first permanent full-time victim services coordinator position a few months ago. This position will play a critical role in helping victims navigate the criminal justice system and connecting them with community partners who can help them recover from the trauma that they've experienced. This position is a huge key in making sure that the entire department maintains strong relationships with those nonprofit service providers. So 14 is that that victim service coordinator position should engage in regular meetings with those local service providers for the purpose of continuing, continually evaluating how our police department can best utilize the professionals in those organizations to support victims experiencing trauma and crisis. So we're gonna shift gears now from a focus on those crisis calls uh, to a deeper focus on unbiased policing. I wanna start by talking about training. The Iowa Law Enforcement Academy provides the training foundation for all officers in the state of Iowa. Uh, there uh, has, there's several functional areas of basic training that total over 600 hours for each officer. While ILEA trains in topics such as unbiased policing, race relations, ethics and professionalism, verbal defense and influence and a whole lot more. Overall, it's a small percentage of a training that, an, that a new officer receives. The city of Iowa City does not have control over the basic training curriculum, but it does have control over our local field training program. The field training program is designed to take um, our, our probationary officers out of the academy and help them make the transition from kind of a classroom environment to the application of learned skills in field situations. It's a minimum of six weeks, but could be longer if it's determined that more training is needed. The current field training program requires probationary officers to review departmental policies, such as those on racial profiling and unbiased policing. However, the process should be mo uh, modified moving forward to dedicate intentional and meaningful training time and resources towards ensuring all officers uh, have an understanding of the history of policing, past and ongoing disproportionate impacts on minority communities and steps that they can take in their daily duties to be unbiased and anti-racist. Additionally, the field training program should provide additional training on crisis intervention, de-escalation, and the availability of mobile crisis and other prevention and diversion options in the community. So item 15 gets at that comprehensive review of our field training program, figuring out who we can partner with to really drive home those, those core values that this plan speaks to. The focus on duty to intervene has been elevated this year. We created a new general order and we signed a memorandum of understanding with other law enforcement agencies. But creating policy and creating culture are two different tasks. We have to make sure our officers are comfortable and non-hesitant when it comes to intervening to stop unacceptable behavior from law enforcement peers. One of the premier bystander intervention programs in the country is run through Georgetown University. And thus, uh, recommendation 16 is that we should actively pursue the Georgetown Innovative Policing Program's active bystander for law enforcement or ABLE training with the goal of preparing officers to intervene to prevent harm and create a culture of peer intervention. 
While uh, training with statewide and national subject matter experts will always be important, it's increasingly important that the police department seek local training through partnerships with community organizations and groups. In the past, the police department has done a good job partnering with social service agencies and groups like the NAACP on community-led trainings. However, these efforts can and should be expanded in the coming years. These locally led training opportunities can be incredibly impactful as the community uh, as the community can describe lived experiences and facilitate open, respectful dialogue with officers in a way that builds understanding, humanizes issues, and quickly influences change. From training, we're going to look at department policy and city code. Now, Iowa City is one of 10 police agencies in Iowa and only 4% nationwide that are accredited. This process requires that you are constantly reviewing policies and monitoring compliance on a daily basis. Currently, accreditation efforts are managed by a sworn sergeant within the police department. Long term, I think these duties may be best suited for a civilian position that would bring a, a non-law enforcement perspective to policy development and compliance review efforts. And that's recommendation 18. As part of the CALEA process, we're going to be updating 36 general orders in the next 12 months. It's been a long-standing practice that all general order changes get routed to the Community Police Review Board for comment. And as we move forward with that this uh, next year, we need to apply the tools that we have learned with our racial equity efforts and include some type of racial impact statement with every policy update that we perform. And this will help facilitate more conversation with the CPRB and community and make sure that we're intentionally giving this thought with each policy update. Recommendation 20 uh, can happen later tonight. That uh, is the final adoption of your unbiased policing ordinance that is on your agenda tonight. In October of 2020, our interim police chief issued new guidelines to all officers for traffic stops. The new measure acknowledges the disparities in stops and outcomes and notes the societal cost of such disparities. These costs ultimately inhibit our ability to achieve our mission to partner with the entire community. The new guidelines provide clear direction to officers to focus traffic enforcement solely on issues of driver and public safety. The desired outcome is for the public to view traffic enforcement solely as an effort to help ensure the safety of the public and not as a punitive action for non-safety related issues. The intent of following the traffic stop guideline is also consistent with the overall goal of eliminating any occurrence of bias-based policing practices. These guidelines were issued with a scheduled review by the police chief after 60 days. And recommendation 21 is that we make those um, uh, new policies uh, permanent uh, after, that, uh, after that review uh, period. In the fiscal year 2019 budget, the city set aside funds to expand public safety cameras into the pedestrian mall. The infrastructure portion of this project was completed with the Ped Mall rehabilitation project that took place in 2019. The city now needs to install the cameras and adopt the policy that's going to govern their use. The city has circulated an initial draft policy to the American Civil Liberties Union and is working through the comments that they uh, provided for us before we finalize the document. The public safety camera network is intended for investigations of serious crimes and is not intended for use as a surveillance tool. Over the years, the department has seen a number of significant public safety issues downtown that has required hundreds and hundreds of hours of investig investigatory work. Such incidents include shootings, hate crimes, sexual assaults, and seriously injured persons. Without a camera system, the department utilizes investigators to try to identify witnesses and provide uh, private uh, and identify private uh, video sources. This limits the department's success rate in quickly resolving the crimes and bringing answers and justice to the victims. It also heightens the risk that a criminal may repeat an offense and further victimize additional people. The city appreciates that there'll be public sensitivity to the cameras that cover public spaces. The development of a strict usage policy will help ensure that the cameras are not used for live monitoring unless there is an active public safety emergency, such as a fire or an active shooter situation. The policy will be presented to council and the court, so the corresponding intent uh, is, is known and the use is transparent and speaks to the goals of solving crimes and assisting victims. And that's uh, recommendation 22. 
23 and 24 um, uh, speak to um, our working relationship with the Community Police Review Board and the Human Rights Commission. I see a lot of opportunity here. In the case of the CPRB, it's important that they remain independent, but it's also important that they feel supported by the department. This can be done through regular communication and enhanced transparency. The recommendation reads that the police department should renew its commitment to the Community Police Review Board through regular police chief updates, staff introductions, frequent policy reviews, enhanced use of force reporting, body cam compliance reporting, and a more extensive board member orientation and internal investigations training. The Iowa City Police Department historically has not been involved with the Human Rights Commission. Uh, the commission not only consists of very diverse Iowa Cityans, but their mission focuses on ensuring that all residents know their rights and have equitable opportunities. A closer relationship with the HRC uh, will provide unique opportunities for the police department to build a better understanding and build relationships with the diverse subsets of our community. Uh, item 24 is that the police department should assign a liaison to the Human Rights Commission and actively participate in community education, recognition, and outreach events in order to build uh, more understanding and connections with the diverse populations in our community. Council recently adopted its 2021 legislative priorities. Those included items such as decriminalization of marijuana, support for the governor's focus committee, uh, support for specialty courts and more. And it's imperative that we work with our partners, including uh, other cities and groups like the NAACP to advocate for change and lead by example when possible. That's item uh, 25. One, uh, one thing that's not included in our priorities, but was something, uh, something that needs statewide attention is the topic of race-based calls to law enforcement. This topic was discussed at length at your last city council listening posts. It involves the all too frequent occurrence of the public calling 911 to report su suspicious behavior of minority individuals. These calls often prove to be baseless with race playing a, motiv a motivating factor. An example can be someone reporting suspicious behavior of three unknown black males walking down their street or hanging out in a neighborhood park. These calls put our officers in difficult positions as they must respond, but the report that they uh, receive lacks any uh, note of illegal behavior to warrant making contact with those individuals. A lawful prohibition on race-based calls would need to occur at the state government level. Thus, we need to explore this concept more and at a minimum uh, undertake a public awareness campaign in our community to bring more attention to this issue. Earlier, I mentioned a few ways the police department can bolster the Community Police Review Board. In a few weeks, the, the board members themselves will present you with recommendations. However, one concept that I think is very worthy of exploration is a countywide Community Police Review Board. Currently, Iowa City and uh, University Heights are the only two communities in the state of Iowa with, this, with a community police review board. In the, in the wake of renewed national focus on policing, it's expected that other communities, both locally and across the state, will adopt uh, similar civilian oversight boards. And while this is encouraging, it could also prove to be confusing and inefficient for our residents, who often do not know the jurisdictional boundaries of the communities or understand the difference in governance structures. In Johnson County alone, there's four municipal law enforcement agencies in addition to the University of Iowa Department and the Johnson County Sheriff's Office. One can begin to imagine that if there were a similar number of oversight boards, all with unique policies and procedures, it could make navigating the complaint process more confusing and difficult. In addition to removing barriers for the public, a regional civilian oversight board could help achieve many other goals. A regional board could allow external law enforcement agencies to conduct initial investigations as opposed to having the department that is the subject of the complaint complete that initial investigation. Um, for an affordable cost uh, to each, ag each agency, an independent staff person could be hired and assist the complainants and monitor the investigatory uh, processes. The same person could also effectively lead public education uh, efforts. And so I believe this is something uh, that, that requires further review and, I, and the recommendation is for the council to take the lead on that discussion with your elected peers to see if there's mutual interest. Um, recruitment, uh, shifting gears to recruitment, uh, it's, it's been a huge focus of the department for the last several years. Uh, we've made measurable progress on increasing the diversity of our department, but only so much progress can be made with traditional approaches. 
And I'm personally interested in exploring an Iowa City-based public safety apprenticeship program that could help remove more barriers to successful application. Uh, <clears throat> this recommendation reads that the city shall explore the creation of a local public safety apprenticeship program to bolster efforts to increase the number and diversity of applicants for a wide variety of public safety positions, including police officers, firefighters, and even some public works positions. The program would pay a stipend to participants who would learn critical skills and perform limited duties and community service. Now, there are some state requirements that are fairly rigid, and we've seen the disproportionate, uh, we, we've seen a disproportionate portion of our minority applicants fall off during uh, the written exam and the physical testing components of the police hiring process. So we need to be more aggressive with our support programs, such as study sessions and physical training programs. And that's recommendation 29, is to really build support systems that can help our applicants uh, through those stages of the hiring process. We have high expectations for our officers and the community's expectations are gonna to continue to grow. And that can be healthy and help us improve our service levels. However, if you wanna set the bar at its highest point, you have to show strong support and invest in the people performing the work. In my view, a police officer is the most difficult job in local government. Officers have to be on top of their game at all times. Officers experiencing their own trauma and crisis from work-related experiences are not able to perform at their peak and may be more prone to making poor decisions in the field. Making sure all officers get the support they need to work through stress will translate to higher performance and better decision-making on the streets. In recent years, the department created a peer support team. This team of sworn and civilian employees provides confidential assistance and outreach to uh, personnel, as well as their families who may be experiencing personal or professional crisis. If these problems are identified in an early stage, they're more likely to be successfully treated or resolved. But there are times when professional help is needed and we need to remove barriers and encourage use of professional assistance uh, when we can. One increasingly popular therapy with first responders is eye movement desensitization, desensitization uh, reprocessing or EMDR. And that's a, a therapeutic approach for dealing with distressing memories. Uh, and those certified professionals can help officers process negative memories associated with their work and help them move forward with comfort and continuing to serve the public in their policing role. So number uh, 30 is to uh, seek partnerships with EMDR certified professionals and cover the expense for the initial officer consultations in order to reduce barriers to this service and ensure officers have needed uh, resources to process distressing memories and perform uh, to the best of their abilities. Iowa City police officers have a strong uh, ethic towards community service. As a group, they collectively support local charities throughout the year. Individually, officers have been known to personally assist the people that they come across in their, in their daily duties. Many also volunteer and contribute to the community through service on nonprofit boards, local schools, and extracurricular youth activities. The benefits of community service go well beyond the individual act of volunteering. In a high stress work, such as a police officer, that, volunteer, that volunteerism can help keep officers grounded and relieve anxiety while simultaneously building important connections in the community. And 31 is, is an encouragement that the city explore a pilot program that requires officers to spend a portion of their shift time uh, volunteering with an Iowa City based nonprofit um, or working uh, towards a community service project at all time uh, uh, throughout the uh, throughout the year. I think a program like this, uh, if structured correctly, could have a significant positive impact on individual job performance while also helping build important bridges uh, in our community. The last five recommendations fall into a public data and communications heading. Uh, it's clear to me that we need uh, more time dedicated to preparing timely uh, information about our operations and trends in the community. We currently rely on, on sworn positions to handle that work, and I think we would benefit tremendously from a uh, professionally trained communications position. I suggest that this, civilian, that this be a civilian position outside of the department within the city manager's office. This position uh, could also assist the fire department, which has a similar lack of dedicated resources to public communications. So 32 is that a public uh, safety communications position be created in the city manager's office 
with a focus on improving transparency, responsiveness, and proactive messaging with the community. And it's clear to me that we got a lot of work to do on our, on our uh, department website. We do share quite a bit of information. All of our general orders are on the website. We have uh, other good information on the site, but it's not always well organized or clearly communicated uh, in a way that the public can easily understand. So 33 uh, gets at that is, is uh, with the adoption of the final plan is to really restructure and rebuild that website around the content of the plan and make sure that we are very clear and very transparent uh, about uh, the work that we do and uh, the impact that we have on the community. In addition to ensuring the website has up-to-date operations, the department should explore participation in public data portals that are aimed to enhance a greater understanding and accountability uh, of law enforcement. One such portal is the Police Data Initiative. This is a national effort that not right now has over 130 law enforcement agencies participating. There are no participating agencies in the state of Iowa. Now, these public portals uh, not only promote transparency and accountability, but they can also assist critical research in the industry and facilitate the sharing of best practices that improve uh, operations for all the uh, participating agencies. As I mentioned in my introduction, I wanted to make sure that this preliminary plan did not close the doors on, on conversations about policing. And my last two recommendations are designed to keep these conversations alive past the final adoption of the plan. Uh, 35 is that beginning in 2021, the department should begin quarterly town hall style listening posts with the public in alternating locations throughout the community. So it's really inspired by your listening posts that you conducted this fall. And I think that should continue. And I think the department can take the lead on that. Uh, 36 is that uh, we reconvene the city manager's round table in 2021. It's been on hiatus since the pandemic and initiate a review of the Leadership Conference on Civil uh, and Human Rights 2019 report entitled A New Era of Public Safety, a Guide to Fair, Safe, and Effective Community Policing. This report was shared to me by the Iowa Nebraska NAACP and really helped my sh shape my thinking on, on this plan and, and, and our department. I would urge you all to read the document and anyone in the public that cares about this issue at all to, to read this document. I think it could be an excellent conversation facilitator with our, our city managers roundtable group and likely lead to more ideas on things that we can do to constantly improve our services. With uh, those 36 recommendations in mind, I wanna give you a preview of what to expect with the department budget submittal for, for next year. Um, as I previously noted, the department budget hasn't grown considerably in the last decade. The average annual increase was 3.6%. Um, Next year's budget proposal will come in below that average annual amount. It will be less than 3.6%, but it's also going to invest in some key areas of this plan. And those include that homeless outreach position partnership with the shelter house, the co-responder position uh, partnership with community and foundation too, the civilian outreach staff focused on immigrant and refugee populations, and the civilian public safety communication specialist position that'll be located outside of the police department. There's also dollars to continue investment in the data-driven justice uh, initiative, even though that that grant has now closed. Uh, and uh, importantly, I think in the time that we're in, there's also no new fees or taxes proposed uh, to support those elements of the plan. I've looked at our staffing levels and service capabilities, and I really strongly advocate for keeping the, sworn, uh, the same number of sworn employees. If you can't have that full complement of 84 positions, I think you will see us fail to keep up with some of the criminal activity we've seen in recent years. We'll see the department struggle to maintain community policing roles because our officers are gonna be tied to calls from service from the public. We're not gonna have that time for that proactive work that's done so well for us these last few years. Our overtime numbers are going to increase and I think we're gonna burn uh, out our, our staff, our officers. And this leads to a higher risk of poor decision making on the streets and an inability to maintain our very best and most experienced staff. I'm going to end by saying again, we have a great department. Um, I firmly believe we have a strong foundation that sits well ahead of most other departments in this country. We're poised to be leaders, but that leadership requires trust from the top and permission to pursue per, permission to pursue whatever vision that you set forward with the final plan. 
So it's now in the city council's hands to establish that vision and the expectations. And once you do uh, so, I ask that you give us strong support and ample resources needed to execute the plan. It's important that you dive deep into this plan. Don't just focus on the recommendations or my overview tonight. Read the intent behind them, understand our history and where we've been, uh, pursue community feedback. Uh, take as much time as you need to get this few feedback. We will support this effort. Listed on the slide are some of the avenues we'll pursue to garner feedback, um, but you should uh, uh, do everything you can uh, to, to get folks to provide you input on this. Uh, for the public, you can check out icgov.org backslash preliminary plan. There's a survey on that site that covers all 36 recommendations, and you can also send comments to policeplan at iowa-city.org. We'll compile all that information that we get electronically and present that to council uh, when it comes time for final deliberations on this document. So thank you uh, for the extra time. I realize I'm a little bit, uh, little bit long, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity that you've afforded me to present you with these recommendations.